Shrouded by cloud, these ancient rainforest covered mountains hide many animal mysteries, creatures which have survived from a primeval era. thousand years ago people ventured into these mountains and today in Papua New Guinea there are still a few isolated groups living off the forest and hunting to survive Mountaintops were islands surrounded by sea. Thrust upward by volcanic movement to form separate peaks, they evolved in isolation. The animals and plants they now support are quite distinct from one peak to the next. They are ecological islands in the sky. I've been searching the Torricelli Mountains for the black tree kangaroo now for six years. This search has been a bit of like a search for a ghost. You know, you meet old men who've seen it and hunted in areas, you go there and it's no longer present. It just seems to keep retreating before, before my footsteps. And sometimes I really do think that it's too late and it's extinct. But some of the evidence is so fresh, just a few years old, that it gives me hope that there must be a population surviving somewhere. It was Dr. Tim Flannery's own confrontation with death that was to set him on a quest for a completely new animal species. Typhus, he was carried out of the mountains. He noticed one of his stretcher bearers wearing a claw around his neck. He managed to buy the claw. The local people said it came from an animal called the Tenkele. Tim Flannery knew the claw must belong to a tree kangaroo, but the claw was bigger and darker than any he'd ever seen. Tree kangaroos belong to the family of kangaroos and wallabies. They're native to Papua New Guinea, Indonesia and Australia, which millions of years ago were once all part of the same landmass called Meganesia. A tiny animal which scampered about the branches of ancient rainforests was the ancestor of all kangaroos. It resembled the modern day pygmy possum. Over time, the descendants of this animal came down from the trees, evolving into tiny ground dwellers, eking out a living on the forest floor. Attic change led to more grasslands, making life on the ground more rewarding. Wallabies adapted, exploding into many different species 
more than 60 of which still survive today. In a surprising evolutionary reversal, some kangaroos return to the trees. Although clumsy compared to other tree-dwelling marsupials, the tree kangaroos exploited a niche in the food chain. There are eight known surviving species. The grizzled tree kangaroo is predominantly grey. The beautiful Goodfellows tree kangaroo is honey-coloured. And the Doria's tree kangaroo is chocolate-coloured, and so are its claws. The claw Dr Tim Flannery found was black. That meant one thing. There must be a ninth species. Tim Flannery, a mammal biologist from the Australian Museum, began his search for the tree kangaroo a long way from the mountains of New Guinea. He delved back into the records and collections of expeditions by 19th century naturalists. It was only a century ago that the first naturalists got into the mountains of New Guinea and they came across this wonderland just full of undescribed species, birds of paradise, snakes, tree kangaroos, everything. But still there's so much in PNG that remains unknown. I really don't think I feel very different in my heart from those, those early people. Like the Russian explorer Nikolai Mikluho Maklai, known as the Moon Man because the villagers believed he had unearthly powers, and like the Italian Luigi Maria d'Albertis, who collected more birds of paradise than any other European, Timothy Fridjof Flannery is a passionate naturalist. A century later, he maintains that human curiosity to find and define every other living species. I'll have to begin looking in the Mount Samoro area where the claw originally came from. I don't think I've ever been as excited as this. It's just, it's wonderful to be on the tracks of a mysterious animal. Probably the biggest animal which is um, unique to Papua New Guinea here in the late 20th century. Papua New Guinea lies to the north of Australia. The Torricellis are a 200 kilometre long mountain range between Wewak and the Indonesian border. There's hundreds of kilometres of incredibly rugged mountain range here and finding tree kangaroos isn't easy. I've stood under a tree and had animals pointed out to me and looked for 20 minutes and still not seen them and I know what tree they've been in. So looking for this animal is not going to be an easy job. It's very much like looking for a needle in a haystack. Wednesday crosses. Oh. Well, this is it. There's some water here where? Emma? Yes. I know. Headlong in here? I know. That's the habitat. The tree kangaroo. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Lee. Just across that ridge, the summit of Mount Samora, which is the habitat of the black tree For most of Papua New Guinea, people are hunter-gardeners, relying on the forest for much of their food. Yes, thank you, Drew. 
Want to play? Oh, yes. The local people are good bush naturalists. Tim can learn things from them which might otherwise take years of research. Sometimes they bring in animals he's never seen before. It's quite hard to work out just how much to pay people when they bring me in animals. I don't want to pay them too much because that might encourage them to go out and hunt in a destructive way. But I have to give them something to compensate them for the loss um, in their diet of that of that yeah, food item. These men rarely meet outsiders, especially those keen to quiz them about their animals. Oh, it's right, tell Oh, thank you, yeah. I'm leg long, thank you, yeah. No, no. This is the, this is it. This is the foot of this black tree kangaroo, thank you, yeah. This is our first real good evidence for this trip. That's about, and this was last year. You find him last yeah, year, yeah, last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. No, you saw it on morning. Oh. Oh, month of July. Ah, yes, can't do it. Okay. So we don't know what month it was calling, but it was last year. So get on him, put on the water, go on him, go past last month, yeah. Uh-huh. And go stop. Yes. And all monkey got us all, Sana to the full him to come down, kill him to talk, talk, kill him to 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 its parish priest is Father Pat McGeever. He's a long way from Tipperary, his home in Ireland. You can see the decoration on this man on my right here. That's made from the coconut palm. With pins, feathers, cock's feathers, no worries. No, they're not. Yeah, let me be. Now they're going to put um, a possum skin on my head. Uh, in Melanesia, with decorations, we overkill. Literally. I use their bilas decorations uh, the way that they use it for their own celebrations. We would consider mass now as a celebration. Huh? First away from their village mm. and with dogs and the dogs set up the, the mother and caught the mother and uh, one of the men, one of the hunters rescued the baby but the, the mother was mangled to death. So they took the baby and uh, they gave him some leaves but it was only the local leaves that they eat. So he was out of his habitat and I saw him after about three weeks and they had um, di he had diarrhea at that stage and then he was dead within a week after that from di or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. diarrhea. But he was, a, he was a beauty, a real cuddly thing, much more cuddlier than a koala. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. beauty. Lovely. lovely, you know. There's about 700 different languages in Papua New Guinea, and I know a few words of the one of the Torricellis, but by far the best way of communicating is pidgin. <laughs> There's very little land in Papua New Guinea that's not claimed by some clan as hunting territory. Tim has permission to go up and look for the Tenkile on the top of Mount Samoro. He's recruited the best hunters to help him catch some tenkele alive. He'll fit the tree kangaroos with radio collars 
then release them so he can study their behaviour. The expedition makes camp in the mossy rainforest on the top of Mount Saworo, where the hunters say the Tenkele lives, struggle for their own survival. These people have few domestic animals. Hunting has wiped out a lot of the bigger wild animals. There are many areas in Papua New Guinea where protein is scarce and the growing population must live off whatever can be caught in the forest. Nothing is wasted. Bush rats are a common item on the menu. Snakes, particularly small grass snakes, are cooked and eaten. Everything ends up on the fire, even little frogs. Tim still has no idea whether the Tenkele is nocturnal or not. He gives the men torches and sends them out looking. They hope to spot the Tenkele in the torchlight, then capture it alive. The men are distracted from the Tenkele search by possums. They're good at mimicking animals to attract them. There's so much to record every day from weather conditions through to animals brought in. Tonight's hunt though, 10 people went out. Absolutely no sign of any tank lay, any tree kangaroos at all. And all they caught was one small ringtail possum. It looks like Forbes's ringtail, which is uh, we only discovered up here during our survey. It's a beautiful little possum, huh? And you find him in where? You find him in the bush. With food so scarce, Tim exchanges tinned meat for animals, giving them about the same weight in protein. <laughs> Often people bring in animals that I don't really want to buy, um, yet I still buy them and try to release them secretly just so they can uh, return to the bush. Often young kids will see me doing this and chase the animal down and sell it to me again. And they think they're onto a good thing, but actually I know, because I've done all of the weights and measurements previously. Well, I'm out of time and money and I'm going to have to leave some more. I was so hopeful we'd find the animal here. This is where our first clues to its existence came from. It's right in the centre of its potential distribution and the old people used to hunt it up here in abundance. And yet it's not here today, it's clearly gone. I think it's actually vanished from this area probably a decade or two ago. Sometimes I feel like I'm just documenting the extinction of a species and I'm maybe just a little bit too late.
The tree kangaroo paw and Father Pat's joey skin were strong evidence of the existence of the tenkile. But Tim's failure to see even one animal was not a good sign. See you. See you later, Peter. Thank you. Too. In some ways the trip has been a failure, I suppose, in that we didn't find a tenkile. But that might have been an unrealistic expectation at this stage. In other ways, though, it's been a great success. We've found out a tremendous amount about the history of the animal and its loss of range and distribution, I suppose, and I now know where to look precisely next time when I come up. All over Papua New Guinea, shotguns are replacing traditional weapons. And this is having a heavy impact on the wildlife. Papua New Guinea is renowned for its birds, in particular the spectacular birds of paradise. As well as being hunted for food, animals are also hunted for the decorative value of their feathers and skins. Because of the hunting pressure, birds of paradise especially are becoming much rarer. Hey. People love to dress up for their ceremonial occasions. Skins and feathers are favoured for traditional celebrations known in pidgin as sing-sings. In a single headdress, there may be feathers from as many as half a dozen birds of paradise. That's as much as $500 on one person's head, a fortune for a Papua New Guinean villager. As Father Pat said, in Papua New Guinea they do, literally, overkill for their ceremonial dress. expeditions taking place over four years, Tim Flannery did not see a single tenkile. In the fifth year, he returns. He plans to start looking in more remote areas, including the highest peaks of the Torricellis, where the people are more traditional and have fewer shotguns. Tim had heard of a respected hunter called Casper of Wilbete village. An expert tracker, he can read the signs of the animals. People say if anybody can find a tenkile, Casper can. Thank <laughs> you. 
On this hunt, Casper and the others have killed a grizzled tree kangaroo, what they call a yonki. It's the only tree kangaroo common in this area. But even this type, they say, is getting harder to find. In spite of this, it's still regularly hunted. Casper says he'll help Tim search for the tenkule. But first, he wants to show him a sacred place. A small, swampy lake in the heart of his clan's hunting ground. The swamp was once inhabited by giant eels. According to Casper, misfortune befell anyone disturbing them. It's also where Tenkile came from and was the source of all black tree kangaroos. Casper said that uh, last year Father Pat came up here and blessed this lake and drove out the giant eels and um, he really destroyed the sacredness of the place I suppose. And uh, people have come in now, lots of people, and the Tenkile can smell them and they've gone away. Other people have hunted them. About 10 have been killed according to our records over the last year or so. And this was really the last sacred place that I know of in the mountains. Traditional sacred beliefs and Christianity collided in Papua New Guinea and the Tenkele fell victim. Sing Sings, once frowned on by the church, are now encouraged by Father Pat. The word Tenke in the local language means good and the word Tenkele presumably means something like good animal. It must be very important in the, in the lives, the spiritual lives of these people They've brought out the tree kangaroo tambuan, the, the tankulay tambuan, which really embodies the spirit ancestor of the tree kangaroos. Tim and his carriers move on, always on the lookout for any sign of Tenkile. He's now been searching for five years. Hunters and their dogs up here are virtually inseparable. I just can't get people to go out looking for tree kangaroos during the day without their dogs. And yet I'm terrified they're going to find an animal and the dogs will kill it. Tim had posted dog muzzles to the village, but they went astray. He attempts to make some, um, now, strong <laughs> <laughs> Just try this one. Don't know about it. Doesn't look good, would it? I don't know. Muzzles of cane were tried after the tape ones failed. Yeah, underneath. Yeah. Oh, in in by Ross, in behind, I think. In Australia, pal. Try him, Russell. Well, let me stop five minutes, ten minutes, or something. I suppose let me stop yet. Let me stop good, all right. Yeah, I'm by Australia. Yeah, I'm now. I'm like looking.
expedition heads into an area where few outsiders have been before. In the remotest parts of Papua New Guinea, strangers are often regarded with suspicion. When I arrived in Three Fest Village, the air was really tense. I told the people I was a biologist, which was the worst thing I could have done. Two separate biological expeditions had been through the area and in the eyes of the local people treated them extremely badly. They'd broken taboos and underpaid people and basically stolen their wildlife. <laughs> I was led off to a hut on the edge of the village in darkness without a fire, no food and no water which is a real breach of etiquette in Papua New Guinea. You know things have gone badly wrong when that happens. And as the night progressed I could hear the village council outside. People were shouting in broken pigeon and talk place saying yes we should kill him, the government will protect us if we kill him, we've been treated so badly in the past. Others were saying that that wasn't the case and that there'd be severe repercussions for the whole village were I to die. This place is an absolute trap. There's no radio to make contact and we've been here for three days longer than we should have. It's just like these little ant lion pits down here. The ants walk along, fall in, and they've got no way of getting out. I feel as helpless as they are. I can only wait and see what happens. One morning, Tim is approached by the men bringing animals they have caught. He realises he's now accepted. They've brought in a number of animals, amongst them a dark-coloured dead tree kangaroo. Oh, my goodness, this animal looks quite different from the ones over there. Oh, yeah, my goodness, that's really different. But it's, it's got to be the same thing, but just a subspecies, you know, a subspecies different. Yeah, really should, yeah. Quite different from the ones from Mount Samoro. Um, and we're not sure whether it'll be a different subspecies or what at the moment, but it's certainly not the same as the Samoro one, but it is tanky day. It is the, the species. So it's great, we've actually found somewhere where the animal's quite common and we can carry out the study we want to carry out, which is great. It's fantastic. I'm just going to take the stomach for uh, dietary analysis and take these liver samples, which will be the most important thing, because I'll give us an idea of genetic distance between this kind of tree kangaroo and all the others around. So that's really going to be the critical thing to get some liver and kidney samples and we can look at about 50 different enzymes. Results of tests back in Australia were not what Tim was hoping for. It wasn't the tenkelae, but a new subspecies of the more widespread Doria's tree kangaroo. Several months later, Tim was to receive some good news. A message from the Torricelli Mountains where his field assistant, Viare Kula, was working with local villagers. They had captured three live tenkelae, put radio collars on and released them.
News of the accident spreads quickly, and Tim's assistant, Viare, comes from the village to see what his boss is up to. How are you? <laughs> and congratulations. Three tank them colours on it. Amazing. Bloody brilliant. Anton, how are you? <laughs> it's good to see you again. At last, after seven years of searching, the forest is about to reveal its mystery. Tim's first tenkele. This is a bitter blow. Three tenkele collared, and already one has died. Uh, she was a fairly old animal. I suppose it could have been old age. There's some tooth marks here, though. Maybe, right, yeah. maybe a dog. Who knows? Gee, I just hope it's nothing to do with the collaring of the animal. I don't think so, mate. Uh, yeah, be. The collar seems to be all that condition. work, eh? Yeah. Yeah, I'll start from the beginning again. Mm. The skull's been chewed around or broken by something that looks like either a dog or, or something that's, that's been chewing it. That might just be an accident. That animal was just old or sick or something. You know, that little bit of stress was, was enough. Mm. Just hope we can get a fix on those two young ones and see how they're going. Mm. These mountains are such a difficult place to work in. Every day you come back absolutely exhausted and sodden. There's no way that you can get your clothes dry or even yourself dry. My diary is so wet I can hardly write in it properly. You go to sleep in a wet bed with leeches still hanging onto you, nowhere to wash, and just the most simple of foods. No wonder some of the early explorers went mad and shot themselves up here. It just gets too much after a month or two. Some of the men try to locate the two surviving black tree kangaroos. He finds that one animal is moving through the forest, but the transmitter sounds faulty. The other signal is strong, and they home in. I've got two animals dead now. Who did? We've got the skeleton. Really? God. Any idea why? What's happening? I'm just, just not sure what's happening. Golly. God. No dogs? No sign it's been eaten by dogs or caught by? This one was actually not injured at all. Yes. Dogs, yeah. Right. But I mean, after, I'm, I was thinking perhaps mm. if it had gone around for several weeks and, and dog had been up here and killed them. 
But the skeleton should be a bit more chewed up, you'd think. Mm. I suppose we've killed two animals in this study, which might seem like a terrible price to pay when things are so endangered. But we really have to act, at least while we're here and studying. There's a hunting moratorium on in the area. If I didn't come up, the tank lay would disappear for sure. It's a gamble we're taking, but it's a gamble that you have to take. Gee, just last week I was so full of hope that this project was going to work out finally. But now here we are with two of the three animals we've tracked for over a month dead. We just don't know why they've died. The electronic failure we've had, and with this terrible tragedy of these animals dying, I really feel like things are crumbling around me, and in my darker moments feel that I'm just contributing to the slide to extinction of this species, and not effectively managing to conserve it at all. I'm just running out of time and energy. Every day I'm physically exhausted and mentally coming to the end of my tether. Tim's search has ended. His ghost of the forest materializes as he finally gets to see his first ten kilo. Hey, Jari, look at this, mate. Isn't this beautiful? Beautiful animal, eh? The little ten kilo that um, Leo and Primus brought over from Wigote's side. It's about uh, Wigote's about to what? Five hours walk from here up. Yeah. They um, had the mother for dinner on Wednesday. <coughs> Julie, if we can bring this one up, mate, this will be a real stroke of good luck, you know, after all that bad luck we had. Yeah. Animals found dead and radio collar failure, equipment failure. And now someone just walks in with the animals. Great, huh? It's great. Because yeah. this almost certainly would have died if it had stayed there. It's good, though, he's eating it so well. Oh, wow. That's just wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. I seem to spend all day just trying to get this animal the right kind of food. I have to walk through the forest, stopping every couple of metres and letting it down to see which leaves it'll actually eat. I'm turning into a bit of a mother tree kangaroo in some way. This small black tree kangaroo represents a very big event in science. Since the First World War, only one new species of large mammal has actually been found in the wild. This was the cupre, a native ox of Southeast Asia. Now, for the first time in 75 years, another new mammal has been discovered. The rainforest of Papua New Guinea has revealed the tinkule. It's only one baby tree kangaroo, yet it means so much for the future of the species. If we can just raise it to adulthood, maybe we can release it back into the mountains, and perhaps it'll be accompanied by a male. Then we'll be back in a situation of having a family that we can study. We can find out what kind of home range they need, what food they require, and what the basic needs are to conserve the species. so cold up in these mountains that this little baby tankley would have died of cold during the night if I hadn't taken her into my bed. She was almost impossible to sleep with. She pierced my air mattress and was very fond of sleeping on my face. <laughs> but it was all worth it in the end. Tim will take the tankle Joey down to the village. When she's old enough, 
he'll return to Papua New Guinea to release her back into her forest home. He'll encourage a hunting ban and the establishment of a conservation area. Tim will ask Father Pat if he can arrange for somebody to raise the joey. Oh, this is the new little fella. Yes, that's the new one. Yes. Oh, is he a boy or a girl? Girl, a little bit. True. Yes. Hello. Yes. No, me no such thing. It's got sharp teeth. True, yeah. Lovely thing. Oh, we thought it was Yeah. It's so dependent to it. It loves to follow you around. Go just... away. Will you go on the ground for you? Isn't it beautiful, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, little fella. Come on. Little girl, in fact. Yes. Hello. How are you? <laughs> really lovely, yeah. Really cuddly, huh? Really cuddly. Gosh, he's like a polar bear standing up. Yeah. Gosh. Huh? Isn't he hungry? Oh, it's beautiful. It's, <gasps> it's all day. It's just... True. Yeah. Yeah. It's all night. And that is the ideal oh. thing, this, this Ipani. I think any leaf, yeah? Anything, anything at all. Yeah. As long as it's got that bulb, yeah. the leaf bulb. Oh! <laughs> my. Hey! Hey! My. Oh! Why, you're a bold fella. Give me some more food, quick, before he, <laughs> before he turns me into food. I really feel like I'm part of this village. I guess I've been here four or five times now. And um, this thank you just means so much to me. We finally had success after seven years of finding this tank you like. Um, and yet this, this sing sing, this dance means so much for the future of the animal. kangaroos are tremendously important to these people. You can see their pride in having an animal like Tankalay living on their land and nowhere else. If I can only funnel that pride into some kind of, some kind of effort to conserve the species in the future, then I'm sure Tankalay won't become extinct. <laughs>